right, everyone. Welcome. My name is Helen Barada with First Place for Health, Embracing Food, Freedom, Overcome, Out of Eating, uh, Out of Control Eating, and Food Guilt, which how about, I love that topic. I think we all can relate to that, and we're just so glad you're here. I also wanted to say, if this is your very first time with first place. We are so glad you're here. And for anybody that's interested in getting started with first place, we actually have a cool deal. We want to help people get started. And so if you're eager to learn about first place, we have a resource for you. We are giving a 10% discount for those attending the webinar or watching it on YouTube in the first 10 days our member kit, which is four great books, My Place for My First Place, My Place for Nutrition, My Place for Fitness, and the My Discovery. Uh oh, oh, here it is, My Discovery. So, book one, and it also comes with a cool little tote bag. Couldn't find my tote bag, so I don't have it to show. But I'm putting in the chat right now, and this will also be in the follow up email we're sending to you guys. But if you're interested in a member kit, you can use the coupon FP for H webinar MK and you'll get a 10% discount. That's $7 off of our member kit. And it's good for 10 days until September 22nd. So we're real excited uh, for anybody that wants to get started. And it's for anybody that wants a member kit. We, we just want to get people started in first place. So without further ado, we are here to introduce to you Cassie Christopher. Her, she and I have been talking and meeting and just getting to know each other. She uh, is a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in helping women reconnect to the goodness of their bodies in order to create peaceful relationship with food and good physical mental health. And she has a whole bunch of credentials that go with that. And I'm not going to read all of those. You can read that in her bio. But I would like to turn it over to Cassie. And she has some fun things for us to do right off the bat. So take it away, Cassie. Awesome. I'm so, so glad to be here with all of you. Uh, I've had so much fun getting to know Helen and Vicki and your organization, which um, I, I have known about it from Bible studies at my own church. Um, so I'm excited to get to spend time with all of you. You should see on your screen a QR code or there's a little spot that says go to menti.com and enter the code 34557011. If you're able to follow that direction, I, I recommend you get your phone out and scan the QR code. Or if that's too much and you don't want to do it because technology is cumbersome, that's absolutely okay. You can be thinking to yourself. But the beauty of what we're doing here, and you're going to see it come up, is as people respond to this prompt, which is, what is one word that describes your relationship with food? Oh, my word, convoluted is like the most fun word. We've got like a, a word nerd in the audience. I really like that one. Um not because it's a good way to have a relationship with food, but because it's a fun word. So you can see that the more that you, that people are typing in their responses, we are generating a word cloud so that we understand how those of us who are here together today are feeling about our relationship with food. And I want to say, I use relationship with food here intentionally. I've had people say to me, I never even realized I had a relationship with food until you asked me this question. If you're one of those people, that's totally fine. Uh, think, you know, just think, what is that one word? And we've got answers streaming in. I can't wait to see what your answers are and, and where we land. It looks like a few words are rising to the top, and this is going to inform our presentation today. And those words are convoluted, uh, complicated, frustrating, addictive. Um, let's see, our little minty QR code is in the way. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of it, but you can still see at the top menti.com and there's the code you can use frustrating, unhealthy, a battle, addictive. We've got some other words around the side, mindless, a nightmare, yummy, yeah, comfort, comforter, 
Yeah. So it looks like words like addicted, comfort, frustrating. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense for people who self-selected into a webinar about overcoming out of control eating and food guilt. So as you can see, if you're someone here who um, is feeling this way, you're not alone. There are other people who feel like you do, and we're going to get into why you might be feeling the way you feel in this presentation. And I can't wait. Love, hate. I think that is a lot, a lot of people are liking love, hate here. That makes a lot of sense. I'm going to move to the next question. How often do you feel like your eating is out of control? And if you're on your phone, you might be able to, to advance to the next question or it might pop up. And you'll see that there's three answers here. Every time I eat, occasionally or rarely. So uh, we had about 30 responses last time. We'll see how many we get here. If you're not participating in this, you know, technology adventure, no worries. Just think to yourself how you would answer. Yeah, some people are sharing in chat. That's totally fine too. So, okay. Occasionally coming through here. Um, and, and for some people, it's feeling like every time you eat. Yeah, that makes, again, a lot of sense that you would self-select here, but it helps me get, get a beat on what's going on for those who are here today. Move to the next. Would you describe your relationship with food as good? And you'll see that I'm intentionally using that word. If you don't know what good means, uh, it means to be desired or approved of, according to the dictionary definition. And okay, more no, significantly more no's than yeses. I feel like the no's should be so much higher based on it's like half higher, but anyways, well, we can argue about visual later. Um, all right. I appreciate all of you for participating in this experiment with me. And it really helps me get a good sense for how all of you are doing. And my hope is that you will see that you are not alone um, and start to think about what might be possible for you and your relationship with food. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. And, you know, Helen and Vicki, I'm happy to share the PDF of that later if that's something you'd like. But let's get into the presentation. And Helen's my slide driver. So <laughs> thank you for doing that for me. Awesome. All right. Here we are. Embracing food freedom. I think I would imagine I didn't ask you this, but I imagine that a lot of you would like freedom with food based on the answers that you've shared. And today I'm going to be sharing first my story of how I went from uh, an exhausted, out of control eater, burnt out, stressed out graduate student to where I am today, a registered dietitian, a mom, a wife, a speaker who truly uses food for, yes, comfort and nourishment, but it doesn't feel out of control anymore in the same way. That's what I do with my clients. So I'm going to teach you what I teach them so that you can find freedom with food. We can move to the next slide. And what I want to share with you is the verse that I was thinking of as I was thinking of sharing this presentation with you today. And that's John 1, 5, the light that shines in the darkness uh, and the darkness has not overcome it. Whew. I think some of us here, actually, I know for a fact, because some of you have already signed up for my email list and have been emailing me and I love it. And it's so fun to meet all of you. But I think some of us here feel like our relationship with food is darkness and we don't feel hope around it, but I'm here today. My goal is to open your eyes to what's really causing your struggles because it's absolutely not you. I know some of you are blaming yourself. You believe you're lazy, that you have no self-control, that you have no willpower. You wonder what's wrong with you. I know because I felt that way too. But you are not the problem. And I'm going to show you what is and how to get freedom. And I'll share it by going through my story. So you'll see a picture of me in a moment where I recently had a, a photo shoot and the photographer heard my story and she came up with this 
picture. Uh, and I mean, it was just the most fun, right? Because this perfectly represents what all of us has have felt that I'm eating, but I don't really want to be eating. I'm more bored or upset or disgusted or whatever than really wanting to eat. And that was me when I fell out of control and guilty every time I ate. Back when I was in graduate school, I was getting my master's in nutrition, ironically, and going to the school convenience store and buying dark park, dark chocolate bars pretty much every day to help me handle the extra stress. And I would think, well, dark chocolate is healthy. So what's the problem? And then I would go to, you know, my after school job. I mean, it was in grad school, so it wasn't quite like that. And I would eat entire tubs of guacamole, right, to comfort myself because of all of the stress I was under. And I would go through these cycles of guacamole and kale salad and back to guacamole and back to kale salad. And I felt terrible about myself. I wondered, what is wrong with me that I can't seem to have these consistent, healthy routines? And finally, it culminated in a major panic attack where one night I woke up standing in the middle of my bedroom. It was a surprise to me and my husband who was sleeping at the time. I woke up standing, screaming. Okay. That's how I came awake. And obviously that's a great sign, right? That something is wrong, that something is going on. And so I, I tried all the things to solve the problem with eating, the problem with my anxiety. I took these lavender pills that made my burps taste like soap, right? Like nothing really worked. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can see how I'm laughing. Yeah, it was weird. It was weird. And, you know, things just kind of calmed down for me. I wonder if this has ever happened to you, that food was really an issue and then things kind of calmed down because I graduated and I stopped the stressor of school. And it was good, all good for a while until motherhood. And motherhood took me back to the kitchen. And this is the time when I would use Ritz crackers with sharp white cheese and apples. And it really became apparent to me that a component of the problem that I was struggling with was self-care. Because what they tell new mothers nowadays, if you know a new mother, you know, maybe you've said this to her, is that we need to prioritize our self-care, that we need to care for ourselves. And somehow I never managed self-care on my to-do list, right, of all the things I was doing, running a business, having a baby, you know, cleaning the house and feeding myself and, oh goodness, is there time to shower and go get my lavender pills that didn't work anyways, right? Uh all of these things didn't necessarily work. And I realized, because at that time I was working as a registered dietitian, helping women, ironically, who are struggling with emotional eating and weight and also struggling myself. And I, that's such a common, common uh, thing that happens to people who have a struggle, right? And I started to see what was working for them. I was going through therapy at the time. That was part of this picture as well. I was learning about trauma-informed strategies to care for our whole bodies and not just food. And that struggle to take care of myself started to go away a little bit. And I realized that if I wanted to take good care of myself and I wanted to eat well, that those two things are not only connected, but they have nothing to do with food. And what happened is I discovered two things. All right. The first is it didn't feel safe to be present to difficult feelings. So I was eating and ironically reading cozy murder mysteries uh, to numb. And Helen, if you could go to the next slide. The second thing I discovered was I struggled to take good care of myself because I believed my value was in what I was doing rather than just being. So let's take these two things together, numbing because it doesn't feel safe to be present to all the difficult feelings like, am I a good mom and all of the stress that you know is going on and why am I having this stress and how do I deal with it? But also believing that, you know, yeah, they say self-care is important and I believe it is too, but actually I get my value and my worth from what I do for other people. And I come by this honestly, and you do too, if you feel this way. And so before I talk about where these beliefs come from, I want to share with you what life is like for me today in my relationship with food, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about what freedom actually looks like. 
And Helen, if you go to the next slide, I'll share what is possible for, for everyone out there. I think we're told that freedom with food means that you never think about food again, you never crave brownies again, you just never you know, emotionally eat ever again. But that's not the reality because the reality is, is we're hardwired to emotionally eat and food works to help us feel better. That's why we do it. So what my relationship with food looks like today is one of peace where I can eat when I'm hungry. And sometimes I want something sweet and I eat that too. And it doesn't cause me a lot of concern or a lot of a lot of drama right in my mind, no food guilt for what I eat. What happens to me is when things are stressful, and Helen and I were talking about this right before the presentation, when things get stressful or hard, in particular, I've found a trigger for me is if I'm mad at someone that I don't want to be mad at, okay? We all have our triggers, right? I start to go, do we have marshmallows in the pantry somewhere? I wonder if I could make a mug Rice Krispie. Well, there's no Rice Krispies. We have Cheerios. Would Cheerio Rice Krispie be good? No, it's not good. Let me tell you, I've tried it in a moment of, you know, weakness. And so I start to think about food in those times of emotion. And now what happens is I go, oh, this isn't normal. Something must be going on. Let me go figure out what it is. Let me use my tools to deal with it because food is not the enemy. That emotional eating is just a sign. We'll call it a beige flag. If anyone's seen that uh, being talked about on the internet, that something's going on. It's not even a red flag. It's just a beige flag. It's neutral. All right. And you can have that neutrality too. And I really believe that's possible for you um, as well. And so I told you before that you are not to blame and that this belief that your value is based on what you do and it's not safe to be present to how you feel, I'm assuming many of you can relate to my story anyways, that that comes from somewhere. And so we can look at the next slide and the reason that it doesn't feel safe to be in your in your own presence, in your own you know, emotional the world is because the shame from cultural wounding is telling you that you're not good just as you are. That in fact, you're not pleasant to be around. You're actually pretty bad. And, and you know, while you're at it, you might as well self-criticize, right? That's the self-criticism comes in and it backs it up. And so you have to numb that. And that's why you may be eating. I wonder if anyone in the chat is resonating with this at all going, oh yeah, this could be it. Go ahead and, and let me know. Type light bulb if you can resonate. So where do these beliefs, this shame that we are not good and shame be, is the belief that you are not worthy of love and connection with other people, where does it come from? Well, it comes from this cultural wounding. We're going to get into three specific types of cultural wounding. And the reason is because once you see where this is actually coming from, once you can understand why you feel the way that you feel about yourself, well, then you can shine the light on it, right? You can, you can go a different way. You can believe something different, but if it's just hiding in the darkness, right? That burst from the beginning, the light shining in the darkness, then it's just there and you bump into it and it keeps hurting you for, for our light metaphor. So we're going to talk about three specific types of cultural wounding, the diet culture and self-improvement culture that tells us we need to be smaller, thinner, better looking, and we need to do more to improve ourselves. Hustle culture, which tells us we need to do more, be more, can never rest. And then a trauma history, which isn't exactly cultural wounding, but it's really important to talk about. So it's coming in today as well. And once you stop blaming yourself, you can take Take the steps to heal your relationship with food, because what I see happening is that people are using food uh, because they're blaming themselves and they try to problem solve. But if you problem solve and you believe you're the problem, you're going to try to solve you. And, and that doesn't work because these are the problems. All right. So uh, the next verse I want us to focus on for the second half of this presentation is this one, Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
I know I've got some word nerds here because a lot of you liked the word convoluted from our word cloud. And so I'll tell you that vocabulary.com defies condemnation as the act of declaring something awful or evil. So if there is no condemnation, what that means is you are not awful or evil. Your body is not awful or evil. Your eating habits are not awful or evil. In fact, you're good. So let's get into that because that's in direct opposition to this cultural wounding that we're talking about. So the next thing we're going to talk about is diet culture and self-improvement culture. I'm going to define these for you today. Diet culture is the messages that say you will be more accepted if you look a certain way. Self-improvement culture are the messages that say that you'll be more accepted if you constantly strive for self-improvement. So my question to you is, and I am, if you are looking at my picture, I apologize because I am battling with uh, a window that the sun suddenly decided to shine on my face. My question for you is this, who says that thin toned, wrinkle free, uh, gray free and tanned women are the most beautiful. And I have a little history story to tell you. So think of these Rubenesque women from Renaissance paintings. They were plump. They were pale, right? And these women were the beauty ideal of the day. Why were they the beauty ideal of the day? Because they had the most power. That if you were pale, it meant you didn't have to work in the field. If you were plump, it meant you had enough money so that you could eat everything that you needed to eat. And so that was the beauty ideal of the day. Well, what's the beauty ideal of today? It's thin, like white Western European features, it's a little bit tanned, but not too tan, right? Because you see people with the too much tan and you go, mm, right? Uh, toned, but not too toned. Young, uh, maybe blonde, maybe, maybe some brunettes can sneak in, this beauty ideal. And again, my question is, who says? Because what our beauty ideal today represents is the women who have the status and the power and the position in order to have enough money to afford, you know, the food that they need to eat to look like that, to have time to spend in the gym. So what we're seeing reflected in the beauty ideal is actually privilege. Uh, it's actually genetics, you know, luck to some extent that, that you know, that this person's genetics allow them to look like this. And so if you've been comparing yourself to this beauty ideal, I encourage you to question it rather than carry around the shame that you don't line up. Because actually this idea that everyone who isn't this ideal is, you know, unworthy, unlovable, that we should all be striving to get to this ideal is evil and wrong and it hurts people. And yet it also hurts to live in a world that places so much value on what you look like and objectifies you. So there's there's a lot going on here with diet culture and self-improvement culture, but you can start by recognizing, is this ideal something that you actually want for yourself? Is it worth it to you? And the answer might be yes. And the answer might be no, but either way, now that you know that, that it's not just inherently what's beautiful, but rather what our culture says you can choose for yourself. What I'll also say about that is if you're interested in getting some support on body image, I do have next month, uh, a workshop coming out. I haven't announced it yet, but it just occurs to me that it's relevant. So feel free to reach out if you want more information on that. Um, my next slide talks about weight. You might say, okay, Cassie, but this ideal has to do with weight management. What about weight? And, uh, one of the, uh, alphabet soups, you know, in my bio that Helen was, um, alluding to earlier is the fact that I have my certificate of training in adult and pediatric weight management and obesity, uh, too many words to tell you that I have extra schooling on the scientific, the science of weight management. And here's what I'll tell you about weight. Carrying extra weight may be unhealthy. It may be. For some people, it's not. For some people, it is. Carrying extra weight can be influenced by way more than your choices. We think that we're in control of that, but there's other things that impact, like genetics, your environment, whether you have access to healthy foods, whether you you can you know move your body. There are things that you can do to improve your health besides losing weight. You'll see there's a little... Um, a little uh, dumbbell there. I could not think of the word. Uh, 
And the, the cool thing is that becoming physically fit can decrease your risk of all cause mortality, which means dying from anything by up to 30%. Whoa, that's an extra third of life back by becoming more fit. And, you know, actually that's similar or even more than the impact on all cause mortality that, that losing weight has. So there are things you can do that you don't have to focus quite so much on your shape or size. And now weight may be unhealthy, but what is unhealthy for sure is weight stigma, which is the discrimination against people who live in larger bodies, where we think that people who live in larger bodies are lazy or they don't have self-control. None of those things is true. That's just stigma. And maybe you've been applying that stigma to yourself. All right. And so check in on that because that's harmful. And research shows show uh, leads to anxiety and depression. The other thing that's harmful to your health is social isolation. All right. So uh, some people are so ashamed of their weight and their bodies that they try to interact with people less. And certainly this kind of COVID world we live in has made that a lot easier. But the Surgeon's General says that being socially isolated is uh, much more unhealthy than being obese and even more unhealthy than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Let that bad boy sink in. I, that statistic blew my mind. I don't think we realize how important social health is. So the reason I'm going off here is it's not a tangent. It was even a pre-planned tangent, you might say, is because I'm wanting you to see that if you're concerned about your health, there's a lot more you can do than worry about what's happening on the scale. And actually what's happening on the scale or your perceptions of it, or your, you know, the, the influences of diet culture may be actually feeding into that shame where you believe you're not good. And therefore you have to numb with food so that you're not experiencing it. I'm going to talk next about hustle culture. Hustle culture says that you're not good unless you're doing something productive, ser serving other people or making money. And of course this leads to burnout. Obviously, why wouldn't it? At which you then treat by eating, or you treat by rewarding yourself with an Oreo blizzard from Dairy Queen. Unless that's just me, but I have a feeling it's not. And we treat this by eating again because it works. The food makes us feel better. The food helps us numb in the moment. And then trauma. I want to talk about this because not enough people realize the impact of a traumatic history with their relationship with food. And you'll see the last bullet point on my slide is that trauma survivors are at a greater risk of eating disorders and eating struggles. So the connection here. But what I want to share with you is a lot of people come to me and they don't realize that they've had trauma or they don't realize the way that it's impacting their relationship with food. So trauma we can define as a lasting emotional effect to a distressing event, and it can result in changes to the brain and the stress response. And it's those changes to the stress response that make our bodies feel like unsafe places to be. Maybe we're more, we're, we're hypervigilant. Maybe we're more, you know, quick to re react and respond and quick for that stress response to go up. And so then we need food to bring ourselves back down and to feel better. And again, what I hope you're getting from this is some understanding and compassion for yourself because thank God food worked because food has allowed each and every one of us here to survive and get where we are to a place where now we can go forward and heal from the trauma that we've experienced. So be kind to yourself, friend. That's If you take nothing away, take that away. So, all right, the solution to out of control eating and food guilt is to take good care. And this relates back to the shame where we believe that we aren't good because we're told we aren't good. So we don't prioritize ourselves and take care of ourselves. It doesn't feel safe to be with ourselves. And not only that, we don't value ourselves because why would you value something that's not good? So the solution is to take good care. And I will walk you through my four step, my four pillar model uh, to help you take good care of yourself in these last few minutes. So the four pillars are to calm your nervous system. So that's talking about your stress response. And we'll get more into that in a moment. Self-compassion, be kind to yourself. We'll dig into that too. Listening to yourself. And then lifestyle medicine. So we're going to get into all of these because these four pillars together can heal the shame from cultural wounding, can quiet that guilt and correct your biological and emotional need to eat. 
So let's first get into that bottom pillar. This is the most important. It's hard to say. The bottom two might be the most important. This is this is one of the most important for uh, immediately decreasing your eating. And when I work with my clients on calming their nervous systems, they immediately find that I would say 50 to 90% of their food cravings go away. And if that sounds too good to be true, I even checked it out with a person who does something similar to me. And she said, yep, it's true for her too. All right. So I'm not, not the only one who has seen this with my clients. It's that powerful. And this is why what I've got on the slide here is the window of tolerance model developed by Dan Siegel, who's a trauma therapist. And he talks about how when you've experienced trauma, you end up having like a knee jerk response to get out of your window of tolerance. And that's important because when you're in your window of tolerance is when you have peace. It's when you make Make easy, healthy choices. It's when you feel good in your body and good about life. All right. But when you're outside your window of tolerance, that's when you're overeating. You might be binging. This is when you're doing a lot of emotional eating and you're feeling out of control. You're self criticizing. Maybe you're having a body image crisis. I see this with my clients that they're fine one day and then the next day they're like, oh my goodness, my body is terrible. I can't look in the mirror anymore. And I'll say, did something happen? And they, inevitably 100% of the time without fail go, yeah. And then they tell me some stressful, terrible story. All right. And it's that stressful event that pushed them outside their window of tolerance. So now all of a sudden they're preoccupied with their body. And the reason that we do this is because we try to control and get back into our window of tolerance that we think that freaking out about our body and restricting what we're eating and trying to control food and criticizing, trying to control ourselves by criticizing, trying to control how we feel by eating, that that's going to get us back into the window of tolerance. Of course, that doesn't work, right? It doesn't work, but it does make us feel better. And so you can you can actually use a combination of strategies. I use many strategies with my clients to help them calm their nervous system. But some of the most powerful that you can do are deep breathing, Exercise is wonderful for helping you get back into your window of tolerance. If you've ever exercised and like felt kind of good, that's why, right? Those endorphins are saying, hey, you're back in here. Uh, getting good sleep. Sleep is a really critical component to having a calm nervous system and using stress management strategies. And, you know, you can YouTube and do, do a YouTube you know, tour of all the different stress management strategies out there. We've got box breathing. We've got heart math. We've got... Um, that one where you like tense up and then you relax. Somebody remind me what it's called in the chat. Emotional freedom technique, tapping, right? Like all of these things are great ways and you'll find the one that works for you. Of course, praying scripture, right? Like let's not leave out. We're, at a, we're in a ministry here. So at the end of my presentation, I'll also be sharing a free audio guide that you can use to get started with calming your nervous system in the moment when you're really feeling that craving but for now, let's move on to self-compassion. And this is one that a lot of people have trouble with. Uh, thank you, progressive muscle relaxation. Thank you, Jody. That was the one I was talking about. Uh, the other technique you could Google on YouTube. So why self-compassion? I've had people say to me, Cassie, if I'm nice to myself, it's going to be a blank check to go eat whatever I want. And that's the fear. So let's talk about what it really is. What self-compassion means is accepting yourself and your feelings while you practice self-kindness. So it's being aware that you're having feelings, knowing what they are, being kind to yourself about it and accepting that they're going on. Way harder said than done, right? <laughs> Anyone who's ever tried to accept themselves when you've been brought, you know, brought up in a culture that teaches you to be a perfectionist is difficult, but it is worth the work. Some of you have never heard self-compassion before. You've never seen it modeled. So I'm going to tell you what it sounds like. Self-compassion sounds something like this. Maybe I would say to myself, <clears throat> Cass, it makes sense, okay, that you would emotionally eat after such a hard day. I usually talk to myself with my eyes closed. And while you regret your choice to use food to soothe, I know it's been such, such a hard day and, and you want to extend this love and kindness to yourself. That's what it sounds like. A little bit weird, right? But that's what it sounds like to be kind to yourself. Maybe you can do that in prayer. Maybe you can talk it out with God and in and, and practice. What does it sound like to be self-compassionate, to be kind? And 
what you might notice is as I talk to myself, that self-compassion comes with a side of calm. Okay. Self-compassion is calming. And we know that calming your nervous system is so important. And if you needed to be convinced even more, I've got one more snarky question for it for you. So people often fear that self-compassion will lead to more eating. And here's my question for you. How is self-criticism working for you? Right? Not very well. If you are like my clients and me when I was struggling with this. Let's move on to pillar number three, listening to yourself. So many people say self, 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 self self-care yourself. This sounds awfully selfish. And what I want to say to that is when you are calm because your nervous system has been calmed and when you are kind because you're practicing self-compassion, you will start to hear what your body needs and what your heart desires. You will hear what it is you actually need and want, how you would like to take care of yourself. A lot of my clients find that they would like rest. (laughs) They're just really tired. And that maybe instead of eating, they just need to go take a nap, right? Or that they want, you know, something else that they actually need and they can start to hear it because the nervous system is calm. They're inside that window of tolerance. They're being kind to themselves. But, you know, while I was typing this out, I had this sense back when I was struggling with food, if someone would have told me that listening to my body was the way forward, it would have made me feel scared because I didn't trust my body. I didn't think it was good and it didn't feel safe. And so what I want to say to you is that when you're calm and when you're kind, start there first. You know, if if this feels like too much, start there first. But know that once you get to listening to yourself, that is where true life-giving, self-sustaining self-care is birthed from. You don't need motivation anymore because you know what you need. It's like when you hear a baby cry and you know they're crying because they have a wet diaper. Would you let that baby sit there? No, no. Every person listening would get up, would take care of that baby, give it lots of kisses, (laughs) right? Because we love it and it's sweet. So it's the same for you when you really connect to yourself and your goodness and you see that God views you as that crying baby and you can view yourself as that crying baby, then you will take care of your needs when you hear them and you don't need to constantly be looking for willpower and motivation and self-control. Some of you love theology, and so I I noted here that if you want to get into the theology of whether the body is good or bad, um, check out Dr. Hillary McBride's chapter, Holy Flesh, and her book, The Wisdom of Your Body. Uh, I found that so helpful to really understanding what is going on in scripture when it comes to the body. I am not a theologian. I am a dietitian, so I will just point you to that resource. Okay, so... When you are calm, kind, and you know what you need, and you're kind of intrinsically motivated to care for yourself, that's when you can do lifestyle medicine, which is where you use lifestyle strategies and nutrition to treat and prevent disease. And it's so funny because this is where people often start, right? Like we read on the internet, top 10 tips to whatever, right? And we think, oh, I'm going to drink more water. I'm going to do more of this. I'm going to do more of that. And all of that is great. Don't stop doing that. But just know that if you've struggled to sustain these changes, and have meaningful change. The reason is probably because you need the other three pillars first, the calm, kind, listening to yourself. Um, If you're wondering what recommendations would I recommend, those top recommendations are, you know, more plants, get those phytochemicals, those fruits and vegetables have lots of cancer fighting components, Uh, get good sleep, that's come up, avoid harmful substances, exercise, manage stress, and prioritize social connection. We've already talked about how important that is. And again, this lifestyle medicine piece, this behavior change piece comes last because it's so much easier once you've done the other three pillars. So that's the take good care model. When you have the four pillars in place, you no longer feel out of control around food. You no longer feel guilty when you eat. You're able to heal that cultural wounding that condemns you, to find peace with your body and food, to find real freedom. 
And I know what's possible for all of you. I know that so many of you want it based on what you shared with me at the beginning of this presentation. And to get you started, I'm gonna give you my free guide. It's an audio guide, the Crave Busting Audio Guide. And you can go to cassiechristopher.net forward slash free, or you already know I love QR codes. You're welcome to scan this QR code and it'll take you to that page as well. And this is an audio track that's going to lead you through an exercise that calms your nervous system, that helps you be kind to yourself, that helps you connect to how you're feeling and where this craving is coming from so that you can deal with the underlying needs all while helping you bask in how much you are loved and how you and your body are good and you are not to be condemned. So Thank you so much for having me. I hope this has been helpful to you and I would love to take any questions that might be out there. I do have a question. Uh, it's a long question. So I'm going to start with uh, stress, lack of sleep, lack of self-care seems like excuses, they said, and they feel like the sin of gluttony is uh, the word that they want to use. So what would you like to call it, I guess, is what they said. And, um, and then she says, I know that I have the power that rose Jesus from the dead. Amen. Uh, why don't I have power to say no to a donut or chocolate? And, um, so there you go. What do you think? Yeah. So there could be a lot of things going on here. Um, one big thing that I see is when people are trying to control their intake, they often restrict overly much. And what can happen for people who are, who have, who've dieted, you know, I work with women who've been dieting for decades and it's really hard to get out of that dieting mindset, that, that restrictive mindset, um, and into one of peace. And so one thing that I do with people is make sure that they're eating regularly, that they're getting in uh, protein, that they're getting in carbohydrates during the day. Some people's bodies just do not do well with, you know, an excessive amount of restriction. And the reason that's important is because if you don't eat enough or you don't eat regularly, your blood sugar goes low. And then that actually causes the stress hormone cortisol to spike. And if you are someone who has those, you know, tracks in your brain to tell you to eat when you're stressed out, you know, that that's your neural programming, no matter where it came from, then your knee jerk reaction when your cortisol spikes is going to be to eat, it's going to be to have these cravings. And so what we're looking at here is like, yes, like God has given us um, power over these things. And there's some biology here that we have to, to deal with. Uh, and, and that is incredibly important. All right. Somebody wants to know what is the appropriate ratio of protein, carb, and fat, which is a, a very dietitian question, I'd say. That is such a dietitian question. And I would say um, this is one where experimenting with what's going to work best for you. Some people do best on higher protein, you know, lower carbs. Some people do better on more fat because it helps them feel full. And so while this is a very dietitian-y question, it's one that I think is easier to answer when, when working with someone individually and finding out more about, well, what have you tried before? what worked for you, what made you feel good. Uh, in general, I recommend a, you know, more moderate intake of protein, moderate intake of carbs, get your healthy fats. Um, but in terms of the appropriate ratio, it, it really is something that, you know, depends. Right. And I want to say for all of you guys, as several people say, how do you get started? So I'll answer one Cassie has shared some free uh, resources and obviously she's a registered dietitian and available on uh, that. <laughs> of course, I have to cough, but <laughs> First Place for Health is happy to provide you. We have virtual groups, we have online groups, we have groups that are meeting all over the country. Um, we're, and so we would gl be glad to help you get started. Um, and we use the USDA food program we would love to help you, have you get started. And I'll go ahead and talk about, uh, we are offering a 10% discount on our member kit. 
And so I talked about that at the beginning. And so you will be able to use a coupon code that will email you about that. And the coupon code, uh, I'll put that in chat, but you get our member kit, which has four awesome books, uh, My First Place, our nutrition book, My uh, uh, Place for Nutrition, our fitness book, My Place for Fitness, and our My Place for Discovery, which goes into the emotional eating stuff. So I, I really feel very strongly about it and it helps you get started and you'll get a 10% discount for the next 10 days. We'll be emailing that out to you um, in when we send out the reminder about the recording. And we also have multiple things like Wellness Week. If you're available, our Wellness Week um, is in October and it is October 5th through the 11th, I think, oh, the 12th. It's a Thursday to a Thursday, and it is available on our events website. In fact, I'm gonna put that information in chat and I'll show it when um, I create the thing, I'll put it on there. But we also have recently added our weekender uh, option, and that is uh, available. You can come on the weekender, did I hit enter? There we go. Weekender that is, uh, it runs Thursday to Sunday at three o'clock. And so that takes place in Round Top, Texas. Um, and a lot of people, we have quite a few people flying in, including me. Um, and so there's also a shuttle option if you need a ride from the Houston airport. Uh, Round Top is about an hour, 15, hour and a half from Houston in the hill country of it's just beautiful beautiful october is a great time to come to texas so that's another option for you so please consider joining us we would love to have you so get started i think that's that i'm glad to see that all these people want to get started cassie i think that is a really good thing so um let's see we have another one about calorie intake based on goals and current weight or do you propose a more flexible eating plan? So I'll let you go with that one too. Sure, yeah. And again, it's individual to people's needs. If if I'm working with someone specifically on binge eating, on feeling out of control with eating, I usually go with a more flexible approach to where we're making sure that someone is getting their, you know, nutrients in regularly throughout the day, uh, rather than, you know, being tied to certain numbers. Um, but again, it's, it's, it depends on what's going to work best for you. So if you're someone who's finding that you're feeling deprived, that you're feeling restricted, um, you know, that oftentimes is not the way towards freedom. So you have to find another way. Uh, and oftentimes I do something with my clients called I call meal scaffolding for lack of a better term. I'm sure that will never be trademarked because it's kind of a terrible name. But the idea that we're setting up someone's day with the scaffolding and the structure that they get all the support that they need. And again, I'm, I'm really helping them get the protein and the fiber in regularly. But I think what you can see I understand where these questions are coming from. I'm a registered dietitian. I get them all the time. But I think what you can see through the conversation today is that, yes, these pieces are important. And in fact, eating regularly is part of uh, calming the nervous system because of what it does to your stress hormone cortisol. So what you eat does matter. And yet it's more than that. It's, you know, I mentioned sleep for every hour of sleep, you are deprived, you eat an additional 385 calories. We learned in a 2015 meta analysis. So looking at many different studies and that's just right. Like you're, if you're not sleeping well, you're going to have these cravings. You're going to have, um, you know, a desire for food. And so, yes, it's about, of course, what you're taking in and, and making sure you're supporting yourself, but really healing your relationship with food and getting to a place where you don't feel out of control any longer, where you feel freedom and peace comes from um, caring for yourself in a way, setting yourself up um, beyond just what you're eating. I'm saying amen on mute, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, God hears you. <laughs> yes. All right. So we have another question. I have one that's about body acceptance uh, with being overweight at a life threatening amount, nearly 400 pounds. So uh, what do you think about that one? 
Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for asking this question because there is a real tension between self-acceptance, right? And wanting to change and feeling like change is a good thing for us. And if you're having a life-threatening condition, certainly change is important. And so what I think self-acceptance might look like there is accepting how you got to where you are, being kind to yourself about it, understanding that, you know, you come by it naturally because this was the way that you maybe were coping um, with, with difficult things that have happened to you, or maybe this is the access that you had. And so practicing that kindness is is going to be a part of accepting how you got where you are and going, yeah, okay, I'm here now. I accept that I'm here and I also want to change. But accepting is also saying I'm good and worthy of love and connection with God, with myself, with other people right where I am. That's really that freedom from shame when you can say that and believe that. So I would say that acceptance maybe means something different than you think it means. It's understanding how you got where you are, being kind to yourself about it, and recognizing that no matter what, where you are, you are loved, you are lovable, and making decisions for yourself moving forward from that place of recognizing that truth in your identity, that's what I would say acceptance is, you know, and, and the example I can give briefly is I struggle to accept my own anxiety because I know when I'm doing certain things, right, that I'm, I won't feel as anxious. And yet there are times when, you know, I struggle with the, the mental health, uh, mental illness of generalized anxiety disorder. I, I have, you know, and so that anxiety will come upon me and, you know, maybe it's, it's not from something I'm doing or not doing. And I have to accept that it's there in order to, I don't know, move through it in a way, in order to not be fighting that I even have anxiety. There's this great quote by the self-compassion researcher, Dr. Kristen Neff, where she says, suffering equals pain times resistance. And I think acceptance is, uh, we feel the pain still, but we're not suffering because we're not resisting that we have the pain. We're, we're, we're being okay that we have the pain and it's here. And we have hope that we're not always going to be this way as Christians. Uh, and yet, you know, this is the reality for now. Amen. All right. We have a question about my problem is that I have a physical disability and really feel like cooking. Do you have, and I want to say some of us don't feel like cooking and I'm sorry about your disability, but I think that's like a common theme I hear. Do you have any suggestions like a food delivery that you like? Ooh, I'm so glad you asked. Um, yes, this is the part of nutrition I like to talk about. Just making it easy. Uh, so the easiest place it, it, to shop, if this is you, is Trader Joe's. If you can get to the store, because they have a lot of pre-made, pre-assembled foods. So, and you can create assembly style meals for yourself, where you get a bag of coleslaw and you add some pre-made, you know, carnitas to it. And you add some beans and you add some other veggies and put salsa and cheese on top. Yum, right? Doesn't that sound good? Throw it in a throw it in a whole wheat tortilla. Now you've got a burrito. Eat it in a bowl. Now it's a bowl. So I really love going to Trader Joe's and going to their like salsa and dip section. And they've got satsiki and mango salsa and all this different stuff. And I can go, ooh, that would be really good in a, you know, and and get the get the things associated with that. Another one I really like is Hungry Root. Um, they're based out of New York, and that's good if you have a family that you have to feed. All of the, it's kind of the same thing where they just make it easier for you uh, and give you the 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 food that you like heat up yourself. So it's like 10, 15 minutes to heat it all up. If you absolutely don't want to turn your oven on and no shame for that, because don't I understand it? I'm always telling my husband not to turn the oven on when it's 80 degrees outside. Um, then I recommend Thistle out of California. They've got really great pre-made, um, their lunches in particular are very, very tasty. So those are my recommendations. Thanks, Cassie. All right. We have, we have a question. I only am going to have time for one more. So I'm going to go with the, 
Would you say unforgiveness has anything to do with us falling back into gluttony because struggling with falling back into old patterns, even after I thought I overcame it? Yes. Um, yes to that experience. I don't know if unforgiveness is related to your specific situation, but here's where I, what I will say is you're describing a common thing that happens because of the way our brains are wired. So I kind of think of our actions and behaviors as like grooves in our brain, that there's some sort of trigger that happens. And then that part of your brain lights up and has a path that it usually follows, right? And the beauty is our, our, brains, our brains are plastic, neuroplasticity. It means that they can change, um, not literally plastic, but in this sense, meaning they can change. And so you can create new grooves in your brain for new behaviors. And that's what you're doing when you have a breakthrough. You create a new groove. But that new groove does not mean that the old groove is gone. And there's some really great uh, research in addictions around this for people who struggle with substance abuse, that um, for those people that they have a trigger, something that used to cause them to use a substance, and they create new pathways. But the truth is that old pathway in their brain is still there. And that's why when, say, someone who um, struggles with uh, alcohol abuse disorder, I believe that's the the name for it um they they don't go back to drinking like one alcoholic beverage they go back to drinking however many they drank last time they stopped because that is what their neural programming that their neural pathways are built for okay and so all that to say i think that can feel a little bit hopeless like oh geez i can never get rid of these neural pathways i do think over time they can go away i think for some people you know jesus heals them and that's amazing and they don't struggle with it anymore i think for the rest of us uh, that neural pathway is still there. So that means that we're going to feel tempted to go back to those old patterns. And that's normal. And that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means your brain is like a normal human brain. So if I could give you any hope here, it would be, this sounds like a really normal situation and that whatever helped you, you know, get that breakthrough to begin with, to, uh, to connect back with that and use those same tools and resources that worked for you then. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. See you later. Thanks for having me.